the plan is to look at Psalm 8, a really um, profound, powerful psalm that um, is very short, but man, it, it um, is just packed with so much truth that, that encapsulates so much of the heart of the biblical story and, and all of Scripture. So there's a lot to, to kind of think through, um, but it's a powerful psalm of praise, and so it will give us a chance to, to think along those lines. Let's begin in prayer before we get into this. Father, we praise you. You are worthy of all praise and all honor and all glory and power and dominion. Uh, we um, want your reign to be magnified, to, that, that you would be honored as king, um, that your name would be hallowed. Um, help us now as we study the Psalms and study Psalm 8 specifically. Open the eyes of our heart to, to have understanding and insight and wisdom that we can increase in our knowledge of you and, uh, and live in a way that's, that's pleasing to you, that's worthy of the calling with which we've been called. Uh, bless our time tonight, and in Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, well, the, um, go ahead if you, if you want, uh, open up your Bibles to, to Psalm 8. Um, the most uh, basic or foundational or central claim and confession of the Psalter, of the book of Psalms, and, and, and for that matter, the, the entirety of Scripture is, and, and is that Yahweh is king. Um, from beginning, from the beginning, the, the opening scene of, of creation where he commands and creation obeys, and he appoints humanity to, to, to rule on his behalf. He's introduced to us as this great king over creation. From the beginning to the climax where Jesus comes announcing the reign of God that, that, that is fulfilling all the promises, um, and, and Jesus himself is installed as king. He's coronated. Uh, we see his coronation on the cross where he's given the crown of thorns, and he's, he's given the purple robe, and he's given the, the, um, the scepter, and he's hailed as king in a mock way, and then he's lifted up um, to, to his enthronement uh, at the right hand of God, all the way to the end of the story where we see Jesus returning, um, conquering the last enemy, death itself, and ushering in the, the eternal kingdom of God, the fullness of his kingdom. And so from beginning to the climax to the end, the basic central confession is that Yahweh is king. Question that comes up though, what kind of king? Right? If, you, if you look throughout history, um, you see a lot of corrupt kings. Uh, people exercise power through dominance, domination, through, through exploitation, through violence, through injustice, uh, corruption. Um, we as a nation uh, came into being in rebellion against monarchy. And so, uh, you know, just... Uh, central to the, the human um, story, the human uh, reality is, is it dealing with uh, ruthless, wicked, corrupt kings. Um, and so to say Yahweh is king and, and set him next to all these other kings, um, there's, a, there's maybe an, in, uh, an initial tension. But what kind of king? Uh, Psalm 8 uh, joins a long line of scripture that, that explores the answers to that question. Psalm 8 offers profound answers to the question of what kind of king is Yahweh. And so as we turn to Psalm 8 tonight, Psalm 8 is both a meditation and a praise of God's kingdom, of his kingship, uh, of, of his purpose in his kingdom, his, uh, his ways in his kingdom, his, his works, and, and his, his heart. What, the, the, just his, his very nature and core. Um, in the context of the, the Psalms itself, if you look at the, the first multiple Psalms, right? Psalms 3 through 7, once you get into the body of the Psalms after the introduction of 1 and 2, you look at Psalms 3 through 7, and you look at 9 and following, and, and if those Psalms of lament 
are uh, walking through this dark valley, this journey through a dark valley, searching for God, crying out to God. Psalm 8 is this brief mountaintop experience where we rise and, and uh, get a, a little bit more of a vantage point to look out and see God and see, uh, see the way a little bit more clearly. And so that's, that's really Psalm, Psalm 8 in its context is it's this opportunity to, to step back in the midst of all these laments and praise God, see his kingdom, see his purpose, see his, his, his way and, and, and work from there. So let's read through the psalm together and then we'll walk through the psalm together. Psalm 8, O Yahweh our Lord, how majestic or magnificent is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens, from the mouths of infants or toddlers and nursing babes, you've established strength because of your enemies, to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you've ordained. What is man that you take thought of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? Yet you've made him a little lower than God. You crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, the beasts of the fields, the, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. O oh, Yahweh our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. All right, this, this psalm um, has, has a, a few parts. Um, you see this, oh, Siri's trying to talk to me. You see this uh, opening, opening line in verse 1 that is this awe-filled confession O oh, Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And if you look down in verse 9, you see a repetition of that same, um, of, of that same awe-filled confession. Now, here's your, here's your quiz for tonight, your, your sort of Psalms trivia quiz. What do, what do you call that in the Psalms when you have that kind of poetic device, a, a psalm that opens and closes with the same line? I've, I've used this term a couple times. You can either answer by saying the technical term or the basic, normal, everyday term. Okay? All right. Go. Answer. You got it? It's either inclusio or I, I like to say bookends, right? And the idea is you're, you're, you're bookending this psalm with this, this declaration. We saw it last week in Psalms uh, 146 through 150. Praise Yahweh, praise Yahweh. And that inclusio, that, that book ended all five of those psalms. The same thing's going on here. And, and so that allows us in, the, in between to, to go from proclaiming it in the beginning to being able to, to just revel in it and, and proclaim it from the rooftops by the time we come to the end of this psalm. And so you've got verse 1 and verse 9, this awe-filled confession. Praise, uh, or, or sorry, O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The second section is verse 2, where you see um, King Yahweh conquers his enemies through weakness. Okay, and that's verse 2. And then the, the next section is larger, and that fills verses 3 through 8. King Yahweh rules through weakness. Okay, so remember I said at the beginning, the basic confession is that Yahweh is king. Well, what kind of king? The, the outline is helping us see that question. He conquers his enemies through weakness. He rules his creation uh, through weakness. And then, that, again, that awe-filled confession once more at the end. How majestic, magnificent is your name in all the earth. All right, let's look at that. So look, look at that opening line in verse 1. I'll, I'll say it again. That, let that be our anthem, our, our chorus through the, through the psalm tonight, because that's the aim of this psalm, to, to, through this praise and through this meditation, to lead us to the point that we are uh, uh, that, that we're joining the congregation of God's people. We're joining creation. We're fulfilling our, our vocation, our calling as, as royal priests to, to heap up this praise, the majesty, the magnificence, the awe of God's great name. 
When you say that, O Yahweh our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What's, what's the psalmist saying here? Right? He's setting God, he's setting Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the creator God, the God of Israel, the covenant God of Israel. He's setting him next to all the other kings, all the other powers on the earth and saying, no, your name is majestic. Your name is magnificent. Your name is awesome. There is no other king like you. No one rules the way you do. No one uh, does power, exercises power the way you do. And so we see that in awe-filled confession right at the beginning. And then he steps back and says, who've displayed your splendor above the heavens. Okay, so we've got his, his majestic name over all the earth, but, but all creation, the, the, the highest heavens to the earth itself. Look at verse 2. Again, the, the heading that I, that I gave you, um, Yahweh King or King Yahweh conquers his enemies through weakness. Listen to this. From the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you've established strength because of your adversaries, to make the enemy and revengeful cease. Look at what he's saying here. He, he looks at children. Uh, you could translate the first, something like toddlers. Uh, the second, what we would call infants, right? Children who are still nursing, ba- babies who are still nursing. And you, you look, um, on one hand, you've got people, you've got beings that are so weak, so vulnerable, so dependent, so reliant on, uh, in this case, their, their mothers, their parents for nourishment, for protection. And yet God would work through weak, vulnerable, powerless, dependent beings, right, to establish strength, to establish strength, right? Now, let me just ask you a question, uh, those listening familiar with the end of the story, the gospel, the letters, um, uh, does that point remind you of anything? It should remind you of a lot of some things. Jesus himself quoted this um, when he, when he entered into Jerusalem, shortly after he entered Jerusalem, um, the, the week of his death. Um, but, but, but think about how, how often Paul would, would, you emphasize this kind of thing, especially the Corinthian letters, right? Where they're arrogant and they're uh, boasting in their abilities and their strength and their power. And he's saying, you don't get the gospel, right? Uh, God's power is perfected in weakness, right? God's, uh, w- the, the wisdom of God uh, is foolishness to men. God, the, the power of God is, is weakness to men, right? And so look at how God does power, how God exercises power, how God establishes strength from the mouths of infants, from toddlers and and nursing babies. You've established strength because of your enemies, right? To make the, the enemy, to make the vengeful, revengeful cease. How does God conquer? Through weakness. Now let me step back for just a second. As we work through the Psalms, um, there's a lot about enemies. There are a lot of cries for God to come and rescue his people from enemies, to actually bring justice and retribution against his enemies, to, to, to look out for those who are vulnerable and those who have been victims and to, to, to bring them up and raise them up from, from the, the oppression that they've experienced. So there's a lot in the Psalms about that. But look at what Psalm 8 says. Uh, nails to the wall in terms of the way God goes about that through weakness okay this guys this is epic and huge for for grasping the nature of God the work of God the purpose of God the ways of God from creation to eternity and and especially what we see in the victory that he accomplishes at the cross from the mouths of infants and nursing babes you've established strength to make the enemy and, and, uh, and vengeful cease. All right, now verses 3 through 8. We step back now, and so we, we look at him, how he conquers through weakness. We step back. When I consider your heavens, right, you can see the young shepherd boy David um, 
tending his, his flocks at night, just gazing at the, the heavens, right? The, 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 the stars, the moon, and just seeing it all in, his, in, his, in its splendor. That is, that is one thing where we are at an incredible disadvantage in our modern age where we have so much light pollution. We're so, uh, so, so often indoors and, and bound by technology and we're just so out of sync with the rhythms of nature and the seasons and the stars and the moon. And to be even just the, the blessing of being able to look up and see the, the night sky with no light pollution at all and just see... Uh, uh, innumerable hosts of stars and, and, and just this glory and this majesty of the heavens. Look at what David's doing here. When I consider your heavens, he calls them the works of his fingers. Um, I, I think I'll always remember this, but, but a, a friend of ours in, in Vermont, one of the brothers there, uh, we were really close with him. We were studying this psalm then. I was teaching this psalm then. And I remember his, his comment about this because he's an he's a artist, a painter specifically, but he's got a, a, a great just sense of, of art. And he said, this is, this is like what a sculptor would do, the work of his fingers, right? So here's God as this fine artisan, this fine craftsman. And, and, and he just looks at the heavens as the work of his fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained. When I look up and, 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 and when I look up and consider just the glory and the majesty and the holiness of the heavens, right? I say, who am I? Who are we? What is, what is man that you even take thought, that we would even enter your minds in the vastness of all this and all that you've created and all that you've, you've done and accomplished, all the beauty and grandeur and glory of creation. How, how do you even think of us? Or the son of man that you care for him. That phrase son of man is a, is a Hebraism, a Hebrew expression that just simply means human. Um, uh, you'll see um, uh, this phrase applied in the book of Ezekiel. That's God's nickname for Ezekiel. He says, come on human, and he'll pick him up by the spirit and move him from place to place. And, and so you'll, you'll sort of hear that phrase. It's, it's uh, uh, especially uh, significant in light of the, the prophecy in Daniel 7 about uh, a human, one like a son of man who comes up to receive the kingdom. Um, and, and then certainly Jesus would be referencing that and, and drawing on that when he refers to himself repeatedly as son of man. But the phrase itself just means human. And, and so he's using this, this parallelism. What, what, what are humans that you take thought of us? What are, what are humans that you care for us? Not only do you think of us, you care for us. So, so the initial reaction is to see the glory and greatness of creation and, and, and be very humbled to, to, to see ourselves as very small and insignificant. Yet, look at verse 5. Yet, and that, that's, you know, sometimes you'll see that phrase but or yet in scriptures. And, and uh, man, it's, a, it's an important one here. Yet, you have made him a little lower than God or spiritual heavenly beings. Uh, you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him rule over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet. Do you see what he's saying? He, he, he says, okay, we look at creation and, and realize how small and insignificant we are. How do you even think of us? How would you even care for us? Not only has he thought of us, not only has he cared for us, he's appointed us as rulers. He's made us from a, from, a, from a hierarchy, from a position, uh, a rank standpoint, a little lower than Elohim. That's, a, that's a, a Hebrew word that can be translated God and referred to God himself. Um, it, it can be referred to the pagan gods that, you know, it could be translated the gods. Or it could be translated heavenly beings or spiritual beings. And, and the, the Septuagint will use that. And so when the Hebrew writer quotes from this, he'll, he'll say uh, lower than, than the angels. Um, but, but the point is, when you look at creation, you look at the, the, the earth, um, you, you've, you've made him in a, in, a, in a rank, in a place that is, that is the top tier above the rest of creation. He says you crown him with glory and majesty, right? God 
uh, desires to, to exalt you, to lift you up. He's endowed us with profound glory and honor just in the creation itself. He's appointed him as ruler, right? Again, in creation, we see God as king. He commands, creation obeys. And yet in this, in this realm, in this territory called land or earth, God appoints vice regents or, or a viceroy to, to, to represent, to rule on his behalf, humanity. Uh, you put all things under his feet. And then enumerates that all sheep and oxen, domestic animals, the beasts of the field, the wild animals, the, the, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the pass, uh, paths of the sea, all living, animate beings, objects of creation are subordinate to humanity. And so he steps back and says, oh, Yahweh, our Lord how majestic, magnificent, awesome is your name in all the earth. There is no king like you. There is no one like you. No one rules like you do. No one exercises power the way you do. You uh, are glorified by glorifying others, right? You conquer enemies through weakness. You exercise your power and your rule through weakness, you, you see those who are nothing in and of themselves, who have no inherent power, no inherent worth, except what you've given them. How majestic, how magnificent, how awesome is your name in all the earth. All right, this psalm is a psalm of hope. On one hand, it's a psalm uh, that presents a powerful hope for praise. Again, think back to what we looked at last week in, in Psalms 146 and how I sort of set that in the larger context of the Psalms, that, that the Psalms moves us and leads us from lament to praise and that we live in the midst of this present evil age and lament is appropriate and it's necessary, but lament is not the final word. Praise is the final word. And even if we're still in the midst of this present evil age groaning, we have a hope that we'll praise. And so Psalm 8 is, is leading us in that hope and saying, helping us get on top of the mountain, out of the valley long enough to look up and see, yes, praise is the final word. God is awesome. He is worthy of praise. He is working in a way that's worthy of praise. And so it's a, it's a, it's a psalm of hope. Uh, one hand, on, on, in terms of the hope of praise. The second is the hope of, of ruling. The hope of, of ruling and reigning with God, uh, that, that the, God's purpose in creation would be fully realized and, and brought, brought even farther than, than we see on the pages of Genesis 1. Um, that's where the Hebrew writer picks up with this psalm in, in, in Hebrews chapter 2. Um, he he, he, he is, is initially talking about Christ himself and how he's made greater than the angels, that, that uh, angels are, are, have no comparison to him. Yet he, he turns to this psalm and, and says, you know, he didn't, he didn't appoint angels with dominion over the earth. That's something that he reserved for humanity. Um, and he quotes Psalm, psalm uh, 2, or excuse me, Psalm 8. But then he says this, he, he, he says, um, yet we do not yet see all things subjected to him, right? And we recognize that. There is this battle that still rages. Uh, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But he does say we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels so that he can bring many sons to glory, right? And so we see Jesus was lowered. Jesus um, uh, lowered himself and... and uh, uh, suffered and died and took on flesh and suffered and died so that he could raise us to the place of, of, uh, of honor and glory that God has intended from creation. Um, and then when we turn to throughout scripture and, and revelation, we see that's exactly how the story ends. Look at Revelation 22, 5. What's the very last line um, before the, the conclusion of the letter? And they will reign with him forever and ever. And so this psalm steps into that narrative and, 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 and that hope. And it looks back to creation. Um, but as the Hebrew writer points out, as we, as we look at it in, in our present context, we realize, 
all right, that's not fully realized. There's something missing in that picture. And so it's a, it's a hope, it's a psalm of hope from the perspective of God's overarching purpose that, that we'll live with him and reign with him. Okay, so it's a psalm of hope. All right, let me, let me step back now and offer um, just a few uh, take-home points. The first, um, the first point that I want to emphasize uh, tonight is, is simply this. God is awesome. Okay? I can say that in a really trite way. I can say that in a really cliche way. Um, but I want to say it with all the truth and power and profundity to, that I can muster. God is um, awesome. Uh, we, we, we need to spend our lifetime learning that truth, how awesome he is, and celebrating that truth and praising him for it. Um, the more we come to know God and get below the surface of just some... Uh, just, you know, sort of slogan truths and things that we might paste to a wall and, and really get into the scriptures and see the, the texture and the, 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 the truths of who he is, how he works, what his ways are, what his wisdom is, what his will is, and see that we are going to come to the conclusion that God is amazing. God is awesome. Um, God is profoundly more inspiring um, than we can imagine. Um, uh, more compelling, more awesome. And so God is awesome. We need, we need to see that. So that's your, your first take-home point for tonight. And that is the anthem, as I said earlier, of, of Psalm 8. The second take-home point I'll offer is this, that we need to spend more time looking up, okay? Whether that means literally going out and stargazing and just looking at the heavens. In fact, driving as far out of town as you can to get rid of the noise pollution, or excuse me, light pollution, and, and just see the, the heavens in all their glory. Uh, or, or, or going and, and, and looking at some other grand fixture of creation. Whether it means literally doing that, or simply taking time to be still and meditate on God in the scriptures and in creation, and, and just gazing upon him and, and contemplating the nature of his kingdom. How does he exercise his power? What is his purpose? What are his ways? What, what, what are the great things he's done? What, what do you see in his heart? We spend far too much time looking down. And, and, it's, and, and it's not that we live in this otherworldly sort of um, distant, far removed way that makes us indifferent about the, 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 what, what's happening around us. Um, but we can look down to the point that we become overwhelmed, that we become consumed, we, 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 we lose all sense of perspective. We need to look out to see others and we need to look up and see God. And so again, the second take home from this psalm is we need to spend more time um, looking up. The third thing that I want to leave with you tonight is that God wants to exalt you. So stop trying to exalt yourself. If you, if you, if you walk through the story of the Bible, this pattern, this is, this is, this is essential to the, the plot, the narrative, the movement of the biblical story. Again, look, look at creation. What do we see? According to Psalm 8, he's crowned him with glory and honor. God's, God's work in creation to glorify to exalt humanity and yet what's going on in genesis 3 the serpent says um god knows he will not die god knows in the day that you'll eat of it that you'll be like him knowing good and evil and and so the serpent's saying look god's holding out on you god's holding back god's denying this to you and so when when the woman saw that it was good for food and it was a delight for the eyes and desire to make one wise. What she's trying to do and what Adam's trying to do is, is take a hold of something that will, that will exalt them, that will raise them, that will elevate them, that will take them further apart from God, right? Um, go to Babel. What are they trying to do when they build this tower? Make a name for themselves. But what do we see in the very next story in Genesis 12? In, when, when God calls Abraham and makes promises to him, what is one of those promises? And I will make for you a great name. And so the, the, the 
one of the downfalls and the, the pitfalls throughout the biblical narrative is when we uh, try to exalt ourselves. Um, and yet, if we would just let him, if we would just yield, if we would just humble ourselves and, and, and follow him and serve him and love him and adore him, he would exalt us. Uh, I mean, how true does that ring to our lives, right? What, what we just highlighted there in a couple key stories in, in Scripture, right? You know, how often we spend uh, letting our pride and our arrogance just uh, emblaze or, or, or um, you know, boasting or, or living in such a way to put, put others down, lifting ourselves up by putting others down, um, lifting ourselves up at the expense of others, or, or living in such a way just to be, be praised by others, to be, to be uh, um, loved and, and, and cheered and applauded and recognized by others. Sometimes it's not even um, that, that anybody's going to say anything or you'll get some award, but just that they notice and they might have a thought of me, right? We, we live in such a way that we would exalt ourselves or um, other cases where here's something where God deserves the glory. We want that glory for ourselves. We want to take credit when the credits do him. Again, God wants to exalt us. That's evident in creation. That's evident in Christ. Stop trying to exalt yourself. Follow the Lord. Submit to the Lord. Praise the Lord. And let Him do the exalting. Remember what our Lord Christ said. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. But whoever humbles himself will be exalted. That is proclaimed and testified and borne witness to in this psalm as well. And then... Um, so God is awesome. Spend more time looking up and God wants to exalt you. Stop trying to exalt yourself. The last uh, take-home point, fourth, the fourth take-home point, the last take-home point that I'll, I'll leave you with tonight is you are loved, you are valuable, and your life has profound purpose. Let me say that again. You are loved. You are loved are valuable. Your life has profound purpose. Um, I talk with people all the time who struggle with identity. Um, who am I? Struggle with uh, self-esteem. Struggle with the right level of, of, of confidence or, or self-worth. Um, in the scriptures, and, and especially the, the, the two most, you know, the two greatest pillars of the biblical text or, 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 or foundations or bedrock or however you want to say that. The, the two greatest pieces of, of, of the, the scriptural narrative, creation and Christ, right? They scream to us. They, 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 they proclaim very, very loudly against the, the tide that, that would bash ourselves or, or not, find, not know our worth or our value or have any confidence or, or not understand our identity. They scream very loudly that you are loved, that you are valuable, that your life has profound purpose. You were made in the image of God. You were appointed to rule over the works of his hands. You were crowned with glory and honor. We see that in creation. And then when we turn to, the, to Christ... And, and, and see the way that he taught and see the way that he acted and interacted with people. To see his death on the cross. To see and the purpose of his death on the cross. To see his resurrection. To see him reigning at the right hand of God. Is to say, God loves you. He loves you in the most profound, remarkable way. That you are worth him doing all that. To forgive you. To redeem you. To reconcile you to himself. To recreate you in the image of God. To recommission you as the sons of God, the children of God. Those who would be his, his agents, his royal priesthood, reigning and ruling and representing him. And so again, you are loved. You are valuable. Your life has profound purpose. If you're ever struggling... Um, with knowing your identity, with that, with self-esteem, with, with um, self-worth, with, with depression and discouragement that revolves around those issues, understand you were made in the image of God and Jesus died for you 
uh, and that screams volumes of your worth and your love. All right, God is awesome. I want to say that again. We need to spend more time looking up. God wants to exalt you. Stop trying to exalt yourself. You are loved. You're valuable. Your life has profound purpose. And there's other things that we could say, but um, need to stop it sometime. Let's take some time to, to pray together. We'll pray this psalm together. Oh, Yahweh, our Lord, how awesome is your name in all the earth. who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouths of children and nursing babies, you've established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the vengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you've ordained, who are we? that you even think of us? Who, who are we small humans that you would even care for us? Yet you've made us a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crown us with glory and honor. You've made us to, to rule over the works of your hands. You've put all things under our feet. All sheep and oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. O oh, Yahweh, our Lord, our Father, our King, how awesome is your name in all the earth. Father, help us to know this. Help us to see your magnificence your majesty, your, your awesomeness, how great you are, how holy you are, how wonderful you are. And may we be in awe. May uh, we be captivated. May you take our breaths away by your greatness and your glory. Even in the midst of this present distress, this present darkness, the, the pandemic that we're living in with all its uncertainty, with all the fear, with all the anxiety, with all the stress, with all the upheaval. May we see how awesome you are and may we hope and may we trust and may we praise. Father, lead us to praise. Lead us to praise your name. Lead us through the dark valleys to see you in your glory, in your majesty, in your humility, in your wisdom, in your grace, in your mercy, in your justice, your righteousness, in your love. Father, please be with Jim um, as he's been diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, please help him and, and Hold on to him and, and give him health, give him recovery and healing, uh, give him strength and, and, and bring him safely through. And be with June and be with their son Jeff and be with uh, the other family members that have been exposed and uh, with Burl and Shelby as well as they've had interactions with him and with them. Um, watch over all of them and protect them and, and, and give them the strength that they need and the healing that they need provide for them and, and bless them and help them. Father, please be with um, our medical workers, um, those that are, are um, confronting uh, this, this disease, this virus, um, di more directly every day, that feel its toll in, in ways that many of us have not. Um, be with those who, who are on the front lines in other ways, um, who are serving so many, who are uh, quarantined and who are, who are staying at home, those who are serving and, and are getting out and, and doing so much for others. Um, 
Father, please um, be, with, be with those who are lonely and, and whose heart aches for um, a face-to-face visit and conversation, who, who ache for a hug and, and for a shoulder to lean on and cry on and for, for a human embrace and, and the love that, that we share between one another. Please raise up their hearts and give them peace and comfort in you. Um, I pray that you'll give us, give us peace in the midst of, of trial, that you'll give us hope, that you'll um, lead us through our fears and our anxieties and lead us to faith and lead us to trust and lead us to hope and lead us to peace and lead us to praise. Father, may uh, this time uh, be an opportunity for your glory to be manifest many times more. Um, may, may uh, even though we're, we're apart, may this be an opportunity for greater unity as we um, are not bound by uh, habits and things that we can easily take for granted and traditions that can become ruts, but that as we, we are in the midst of a, a new situation and, and adapt and respond and try to do so faithfully to you and, and for love of others, um, may this be an opportunity for us to, to um, know you more, to love one another more, to be more united, to have, have greater fellowship and partnership and unity in the Spirit. Um, may this be an opportunity for um, your light to shine through us uh, as we reach out to love and encourage and build up and serve and comfort people who are hurting and people who are needing help. Father, may you receive all glory, honor, power, and dominion because you are worthy. We long for your will to be done. We long for the, the fullness of your kingdom in the age to come. And we long for your name to be hallowed because you are worthy. In the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.